Imagine this. You are a Union soldier. The war has just ended and you have been freed from Kahaba prison. You are excited to return to your family in triumph. The Union has won the war and you do not have to fight anymore. You see a steamboat now entering Vicksburg meant for you. You now eagerly rush aboard the Sultana. Then, on April 27th, at 2 a.m., a huge sound rocks the Sultana, a vast explosion. You wake up immediately, but all you hear is screaming and all you see is red and shadows. The Sultana is on fire. You do not know what to do, so you jump off the deck into the Mississippi. You and your fellow soldiers, coming home in triumph, are now trapped in tragedy. People are now fighting for their lives in the cold, muddy water of the Mississippi. Let us follow this terrible arc from triumph to tragedy by focusing on the Pickens brothers. One brother disappeared and died, the other survived and would bear the scars and memories for decades after this tragedy. In fact, he became part of an effort in East Tennessee to keep alive the memory of those lost on the Sultana. In that way, what had been a tragedy was now turned into a triumph of memory, saved from forgetting. Samuel and William C. Pickens were brothers from Tennessee. In fact, they were from a part of East Tennessee that was Unionist. For Tennessee, the Civil War was truly a war of brother against brother, as communities and regions split over secession. The Pickens brothers enlisted in the 3rd Tennessee Cavalry, the biggest Unionist formation in Tennessee. In fact, William C. Pickens became its recruiting officer. After much fighting, that unit was captured, very ironically, by another Tennessean the Confederate Cavalry Commander Nathan Bedford Forrest of Memphis. They were marched to Cahaba Prison in Alabama. While Andersonville Prison Camp in Georgia was more infamous, Cahaba was also dire. In March 1865, as the war neared its close, prisoner exchanges between the North and the South began. By the time of the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse, where General Robert E. Lee surrendered, the men of Cahaba and other prisoners from Andersonville found themselves in Vicksburg awaiting parole. Now they just wanted to go home. With thousands of other Union ex-prisoners, the Pickens brothers rushed onto the steamboat, the Sultana, that they were told would take them up the Mississippi to Cairo, Illinois. The Pickens brothers then wanted to continue to East Tennessee where their home was, but the Sultana held a tragic secret. It was even now being overloaded. The Sultana's commander, Captain James Cass Mason, who had personal debt, had learned that the government would pay $5 for each regular soldier and 10 for any officer. Captain Mason wanted to load as many people onto the ship as possible. When one of the Sultana's boilers sprang a leak, Mason did mineral repairs. Now, nearly 2,000 liberated prisoners, including many from Tennessee, embarked, and the next morning, the Sultana cast off from Vicksburg and slowly chugged up the river towards Cairo, Illinois. However, the Sultana's legal capacity was a mere 376 passengers. We are not sure of the exact number because so many eager ex-prisoners rushed on board that officials lost count of the passengers. But this is clear, it was overloaded more than five times its legal limit. To complicate the Sultana's journey even more, the Mississippi River had one of the worst spring floods in its history. The flood was so bad that in some places, the river expanded three miles outward of its usual size. Then, on April 27, 1865, near 2 a.m., one of the Sultana's boilers exploded and caused a great fire. Seconds later, another two boilers exploded. The massive clouds of steam released by the explosion tore through the crowded deck above and caused the pilot house to collapse. The two smokestacks also fell one by one onto the overcrowded deck. The upper port deck fell onto the furnaces, creating a more massive fire. Soon the Sultana burned down to the waterline. Most of the men tried to jump into the water. However, most were former prisoners in no shape to swim. Some didn't even know how to swim in the first place. The people who stayed on board the steamboat died in the inferno because the steamboat sank shortly after. Luckily for the ones who jumped, the Bostonia too was sailing past and picked up some survivors. Others floated down to Memphis and cried to the people at the port for help. Their pleas were heard and a couple of steamers and warships picked up more survivors. However, most of the people who jumped drowned or died of hypothermia. Even 65 years later, the horrible memory was still vivid for Pleasant and Keeble. 
In 1930, he told the Knoxville News Sentinel about what he had experienced on that tragic day. This is what he said. I awoke, standing in bloody wreckage. In my ears were the noises of the 200 men in fear and agony. All four boilers of the boat had burst. I'm afraid that I walked on the shoulders of dying men in getting across that deck. My older brother had bedded down on the other side, but I never saw him again. Somehow or other, I was in the river. 1,700 men died in that river, and I got out. I was on a piece of wreckage. I joined hands with some other men on another piece. In this dark chaos, the Pickens brothers got separated. As it turns out, they never saw each other again. Sam saved himself in a dramatic way, which he later described in an amazing letter to his family, which we read at the Knox County Historical Collection. He was in the water, holding on to a live and very frightened horse. Because the horse was in panic, trying to swim closer to the burning boat, Pickens reached out and grabbed the dead horse that was drifting away from the ship, and thus offered him safety. With grim humor, he told his family, that the deal of trading a live horse for a dead one was the best deal he ever made in his life. In fact, it had saved his life. In the same letter to his family, he mournfully shared that he had no news of his brother and assumed he was dead. There are different estimates for the death toll of this tragedy. Many later estimates hovered around 1,700 to 1,800 deaths. It was deadlier than Titanic, which everybody knows about. It was also the deadliest shipwreck in the 19th century worldwide. If this disaster is so huge, why is it that many people do not know about it today? News coverage in April 1865 focused on the ongoing hunt for President Abraham Lincoln's killers. The sheer scale and sorrow of all the lives lost in the Civil War overshadowed the wreck of the Sultana. But now, in the aftermath of this disaster, we can observe how this tragedy in the very midst of triumph was turned into another triumph as survivors and families of Sultana victims worked to save the memory of the Sultana from being forgotten. One survivor, Reverend Chester Berry, even wrote a valuable book collecting testimonies about the tragic event. By 1889, meetings of survivors from different parts of East Tennessee were taking place in the Knoxville area. South of Knoxville, in Mount Olive Cemetery, a survivor named John H. Simpson helped create a Sultana monument that still stands today. In Tennessee marble, this monument record almost 400 names of Tennesseans who endured the Sultana disaster. The Pickens brothers' names are on the monument. Samuel, who survived, and William, who did not. The monument showed a beautiful picture of the Sultana. Later, someone added an odd smokestack to the monument. The monument was dedicated in 1916 over half a century after the Sultana explosion. into the Tennessee River to remember the men of the Sultana. The last survivor, Pleasant M. Keevil, apparently died in 1931, which is 66 years after the disaster. In fact, descendants of the Sultana men keep the memory of it alive today, as does a small museum near Memphis. But in fact, all of us should recall this amazing story, how a moment of triumph turned into unexpected tragedy and how the efforts of survivors triumphed over forgetting.